Renee, how was Life Group? You know, I loved it. Those women were so open and honest and friendly. And I have news. I went home and I gave my life to Christ. I, you know, I always thought I was a Christian, but I realized last night that I really never surrendered my life to him. I was just going through the motions. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, you know, why don't you uh, come over tonight for dinner and tell my wife uh, and you can tell her about your testimony. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, um, you know, she makes a wonderful meatloaf. Mm, I love meatloaf. Oh, you do? Great. I would invite you uh, to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 15 through the end of the chapter in Matthew 22. If you didn't bring a Bible, it's on page 828 and the Bible in the rack in front of you. You know, we're inspired by people who have inspiring, eloquent messages. This week we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. No one even remembers the two-hour talk by Everett. They remember Abraham Lincoln's talk the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it was an inspiring conversation with the crowd about the sacredness of the lives lost in the Battle of Gettysburg. Some 25,000 plus people died in that great battle. And then on Thursday, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I'm old enough to remember the day that he died. Uh, I remember my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Cleveland, going out in the hallway for some reason and then coming back in in tears telling us about John F. Kennedy's death. And uh, there's many th things written about John F. Kennedy, but he was an eloquent, inspiring speaker. Uh, we can all remember, uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We remember his famous speeches and how he started the Peace Corps. One of my brothers went off at the Peace Corps. Um, history has a way of reminding us of inspiring examples. But what we're going to find in Matthew 22 today is an inspiration that is not equaled among human beings. It is the inspiring words of Jesus Christ. And it's inspiring to us and has been for 2,000 years, even though it comes in the context of hostility and anger. People are upset with him. He has come into the very sacred place of Jerusalem, turned over the money changer tables, and he said, this is my house and it's to be a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of robbers. And then he talked about the way in which the religious leaders of that day had really taken people away from God rather than toward God. You know, I was thinking about Dr. Alvin Sanders and his speaking to us last week. And he, would, would anyone disagree if I said that he was excited? Uh, I mean, uh, not only was he excited, but we became excited. I mean, th there was a lot of help with Dr. Sanders. I'm not saying that I need that same kind of help. You know, it's like he said, the way white preachers preach, you know, it's to God's frozen chosen. I hope we're not that way. But he was excited, and I thought about it all week long. Why was Alvin so excited? It was because he saw Jesus Christ change lives. The story of Lolo and how that church came together, blacks and whites, to stand before that judge, and that judge broke down in tears. All because of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. If you had an opportunity to talk to Jesus, what would you ask him? Maybe you'd ask him about, you know, is it really necessary for us to pay taxes to the government? That would be a question. Or someone else might say, 
Jesus, is there really life after death? Someone else might say, what, what should my priorities in life be? I'm so busy. It seems like there's so much going on. What should my priorities be? Interestingly enough, in Matthew 22, Jesus, our inspiring leader, answers those three questions. Taxes, death, and priorities. Three test cases brought by hostile leaders and he answers them, and then he asks them a question. Let's look at it for a few minutes before we celebrate communion. Would you join me here in Matthew 22? And let's just ask the Lord to be with us as we study his word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the things that you said, the things you taught us, the life-changing truth we find every week as we open this book, and every day as we have our time with you. So teach us again, we pray. May your Holy Spirit open our eyes to the truth here. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice a couple of things as we read through this in these three test cases. Jesus is amazingly patient with these hostile people. It's incredible to me. Sometimes when we get into an argument with someone at least I do, I get all uptight and upset. Jesus is so patient. The second thing I want you to notice is how often he refers to the scripture. Jesus grew up just like you and me, human being, with a mind like ours, and he had to absorb the scriptures. But as we look at this passage, you see how he not only absorbed it, but he understood it in light of a God-centered reality. So let's look at these three test cases and then we'll conclude with his question back to them. First of all, he asks the questions, he's asked a question about taxes. Matthew 22, verse 15. In Matthew 22, verse 15, it says, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him with his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you're true and teach the way of God truthfully and that you do not care about anyone's opinion for you're not swayed by appearances. <clears throat> Tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now please note here, they're flattering Jesus, aren't they? Oh, we know you're this and we know you're that, but it's a trap. But I want you to notice that the flattery is true. Jesus is not impressed with what people think of him. He's not swayed by anyone's opinion. He speaks the truth. Now, I want you to notice that there are two groups of people presented here who come testing Jesus. It's the Pharisees that we know are serious-minded Bible students, that is the Old Testament student scriptures, and then the Herodians who are loyal to Herod, who works for Rome. So it's like two opposite groups get together to test Jesus. And they're putting him in a no-win situation. They're asking him a question about taxes paid to Caesar. If Jesus says, no, you don't need to pay taxes to Caesar, because the Romans shouldn't be in here controlling things anyway, well, then the Herodians would come forward and say, hey, Jesus needs to be arrested. But if Jesus says, yes, you should pay taxes, then the zealots of the day, the Pharisees of the day, who despise Caesar, and after all his picture, and uh, saying that he's divine is on the coins that they're using, well, they would be upset. So he's in a no-win situation. So Jesus answers this test question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Verse 18. And Jesus, aware of their malice, please note, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And so they brought him a denarius, which is just a, a small coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and in inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. I could just see them as they're going away. Oh, you know, he pulls out the coin 
Whose picture is George Washington? Only in this case, it's Caesar. Okay, then, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And the Pharisees and Herodians kind of just kind of looking there, stunned, and, and then they walk away, and, and one pokes the other. Who, who agreed to ta- ask him that stupid question anyway? You know, Jesus is brilliant because his answer completely brings a God-centered focus to life. You know, that verse, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's to God, the things that are God's, is often used to show a sacred, secular division in society. You know, well, we do things Monday through Saturday, that's the secular side, we render to Caesar, and then on Sunday we do the secular. Jesus abolishes that whole thinking. He says, Yes, we do owe the government something. After all, Caesar's imprint on the coin meant he owned the coin. Pay him what he owed, what we owe him, which was not as big big a deal. It was the tax paid by census to the Roman government. But then he said, but there's a bigger issue here. Render to God the things that are God's. Implied here is that there are two images. One image is on the coin. Another image is on us. We are created in whose image? God's image. And in one swoop, Jesus says, we do have a responsibility to the government, pay your taxes, but there is even a greater thing here, and that's that we're created in the image of God. Which means when we walk out of this room, it is not walking out of the sacred place into the secular. We are walking as images of God into our families, into our workplaces. And everything we do represents God. So often I hear people say, oh, my work is so meaningless. I wish I could be a pastor or something like that. It'd be more meaningful. And I think, oh, you're missing it. Whatever your calling in life, God has made you in his image and you are his Monday morning pulpit. The people with whom you work are the people he has brought you to. In one statement, Jesus obliterates the sacred secular myth and says all of life is sacred because human beings are made in my image. No wonder no one can say anything. And so, the Sadducees, another group, seize their opportunity and they come to him. Test case number two. What about death? What about marriage? What about resurrection? What about death? Ever had questions about death? Well, that same day, the Sadducees came to him. Verse 23 Sadducees are those who say there's no resurrection. Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, so they're sad, you see. And they believe, they're not atheists, they believe in the first five books of the Bible, which we call the Torah, but they don't see much about resurrection there, and so they think it's an absurd idea. And so they ask Jesus a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children and his brother must marry the widow and raise up the offspring for her brother. Now there's seven brothers among us. The first married and died and having no offspring left, he said to his brother, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third down to the seventh. After them, all the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. So you see what they're saying here. This is a a well-known passage from the Old Testament that Moses speaks in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 6, and it's called Leveret Marriage. Uh, This is something that the law was implemented to protect the family name. So if someone were to die, if a brother were to die, then another brother could marry that wife and raise children continuing to bear that name. 
We don't have any evidence that was widely practiced, especially in the time of Jesus. But the Sadducees go back to that teaching on leveret marriage and apply it to resurrection, trying to put Jesus in a bind. Now, they could have said um, a man ha- died and he had a brother and the brother married whose husband would she, would, would she have in heaven. But, you know, they embellished it, seven brothers. Uh, I know of a guy, his, his name is Bill. He told his sister-in-law, have you ever seen this thing about leveret marriages? If, if my brother dies, I'd have to marry you. And, and she went home and put his brother on a diet and exercise. She didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, we can't imagine it in our day and age, but it was a way to perpetuate the family name. But the Sadducees used it to show the absurdity of resurrection. So how is Jesus going to answer this? Well, he says in verses 29 to 33, Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the Scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? And and here he's quoting Moses. Moses' words in Exodus 3, 6, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, what is Jesus doing here? He is teaching the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. He is saying that there will come a day when we will be in heaven with real resurrection bodies. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection at all. Pharisees didn't understand it clearly. Jesus is saying we will have bodies, but it will be totally different than on earth. On earth, we have marriage and we have intimacy and we have procreation. There will not be a need for procreation in heaven. We will be like the angels, not angels, but like the angels, and it will be a new day. It will be totally different. Just read 1 Corinthians 15. The Apostle Paul spends the whole chapter reflecting on the glories of what heaven will be like. Jesus believes this. And he says to them, the reason that you're mistaken is because, number one, you don't understand the Scripture. And number two, you don't understand the power of a God able to do resurrection work. They're completely misunderstanding the scriptures and the power of God. Jesus knew scripture, and so he goes back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Remember, this is God speaking to Moses, and he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Those three patriarchs had died hundreds of years before, but God uses the present tense. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of... He says, I am the God of Isaac, Abraham, Jacob. Meaning that God is the God of the living. And so in one quick statement, Jesus adheres to the resurrection of the body, the bodily resurrection of the soul. We say it when we say the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection. Jesus believes in the resurrection, and he uses Scripture. The very Scripture they hold from the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy. Is it any wonder that the crowd is astonished at the teaching of Jesus? I don't know about you, but I've spent many cold and warm days standing at gravesides reading 1 Corinthians 15. Thinking about the body in the casket to be lowered in the ground. It would be so easy for feelings of despair to come over us at times like this. To think that death is it and there's no life to come. 
But I take great hope as we stand before graves that the Bible promises that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the first resurrected, the trumpet will blast, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, will be with the Lord forever. We will recognize each other. There will not be marriage as we know it, but we'll know each other. It will be a reunion. We will be so awed by the presence of God. There will be rejoicing people we haven't seen for years. <laughs> I hear Jim saying amen over there. He's going to see his brother again. We're going to see parents. We're going to see children there. And we're going to rejoice in the Lord forever in the new heaven and the new earth. Nothing can turn a cold, wintry day standing before a graveside into more of a day of hope than the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, here's people trying to test Jesus. They're not asking him questions they're curious about. They're trying to test him. You get him into trouble. And so he goes on, because even though the Sadducees walk away, the Pharisees come back. Verses 34 to 40. And they ask him a question about priorities. Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked a question to test him. Now, a lawyer is an expert in the Old Testament law. They taught Old Testament theology and application. And they're testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest, which is the great commandment in the law. Now, you may have never had to sit through an ordination exam. I've had to sit through one. The only thing that has been better than that for me uh, under the grilling of religious experts is to watch Pastor Robin grilled in an ordination exam and then to see Pastor Phil grilled and to see Pastor Jason grilled. It's so much fun to be on the grilling side rather than on the one being grilled. But Jesus here is being grilled. This is like an ordination exam. This was a debated question. As they looked, there were all these commands of the Old Testament. In addition, the Pharisees added 613 laws and teachings of the rabbis and the scribes. So which is the great commandment? And they divided them up. There were some that were lightweight commands and some that were heavyweight. They wanted to test Jesus. What would Jesus say? And they were hoping by his answer to get him into trouble, to put him down in front of the crowds, to find a cause to arrest him. Note Jesus' answer, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. And here I want to tell you, Jesus is quoting two Old Testament passages. Verse 37, And he said to, the, to him, the lawyer, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So when he says, love God with heart, soul, mind, he's saying, love God with your whole being. And he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. It's what's known as the great Shema. Our God is one, and you shall love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jewish people still today read Deuteronomy 6, the great Shema, in the morning and in the evening. It's the first greeting of the day. It's the last prayer of the day. They were very familiar with this. Jesus said, that is the great commandment, to love God. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And there Jesus quotes Leviticus chapter 19, 18. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. But I mean, who can really follow this? 
You know, in many ways, this is a summary of the Ten Commandments because the first few commandments talk about loving God, honoring Him, not taking His name in vain, not putting any idols before Him. The last half of the table of the law is about loving your neighbor, not coveting them, stealing from them, murdering them. So it's a summary of the Ten Commandments. But Jesus says it's a summary of the whole Old Testament. He includes the prophets here. He's saying like two pegs on which everything else hangs are two love commands. The greatest priority of life is to love God with your whole being. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law summarized in the word love. How can we do that? Think about how can anyone love God with their whole being? Would anyone here say they measure up to that standard? Who here could say, I love my neighbor as myself? You know, we really do love ourselves, but do we love our neighbor as we, much as we love ourselves? Well, of course not. Who can measure up to that? And Jesus is saying, if you want a command, try these. Loving God, loving neighbor. Well, the answer, of course, in 1 John chapter 4, we discover that the only way we can love is through God's prior love for us. We love, the Bible says, because he first loved us. The only way we can hope to love God in ever-increasing ways is to more and more know the prior love he has for us. And then knowing that love, we pass it on. 38 years ago this week, my wife and I celebrated our first date anniversary. November 19, 1975, Pagli Eyes Pizza in Iowa City. I was so nervous, I couldn't risk going out with her alone, so I invited my best friend and we double dated. I thought that way if I didn't know what to say and if Cindy didn't know what to say, at least there'd be somebody else there to keep the conversation going. I was very bashful, still am. 38 years ago, I thought that I loved Cindy the first time I had that date and got to know her. But I had no idea the depth of love I would have 38 years later. To think that that woman in so many ways, pours herself out for me. And I'm not the easiest person to live with. Does that surprise anybody here? I've often told my wife, if she would speak up, she could ruin me. I'm not the easiest person to live with. We've had some rough years, but she has persevered. And sometimes I've looked at that woman who I love, my best friend on earth, and I say to myself, how can she love me like that? Only one reason. The love of Jesus Christ has come to Cindy, and she's able to love me. It's the only answer I could come up with. The more we know God and his prior love, the more we can love him back and the more we can pass that love on to others. And so Jesus turns this test case into the greatest priority for us today. In view of all the demands that come to us, the greatest of all demands is to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the priority. In every situation, to love him. And so in, infested with his love, is that a good word? Indwelt by his love, empowered by his spirit to pass it on to others. That's what love is. Well, you know, they get to the end of the questions and then Jesus asks them a question. And it's the heart of the whole passage because Jesus says, you ask me these test questions about taxes and death and priorities. Let me ask you a question. Who is the Christ? 
It all gets back to who is he. Because that's why they're questioning him for his authority. And he says in verse 41, Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, Well, the son of David. They know their Old Testament, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 14. The Messiah would be an ancestor or would be a, from the seed of David, King David, the son of David. They know their Bibles. But then Jesus goes on in verse 43 to say, well, then how is it that David, King David, in the Spirit that is illumined by the Holy Spirit, calls the son of David, Lord, saying, and here he's quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, the most widely quoted verse in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one is able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more. Jesus says it all gets down to this. Who is the Christ? Well, he's the son of David. Why then did David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Psalm 110, verse 1, say, The Lord, capital Lord, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, why did the Lord say to my Lord, Adonai, Your throne is forever. You will reign at the right hand. You will put your enemies under your feet. And they were silenced because they knew that Jesus was saying that King David could see it, that the Messiah would be both man, son of David, and God, Lord. And standing before them that day was the Messiah. They didn't know what to say. You know, what impresses me about this is that Jesus is Lord and everything falls into place around him. And even with these hostile leaders, Jesus showed amazing restraint and compassion. He's looking them in the eye. He's telling them the truth. He wants them to bow before him and worship him as Lord. Rather than condemning him, condemning them. He's opening his arms wide to them. Do you know who I am? Who is the Christ? The only appropriate response is to say, I need to repent of my sins and fall before you and trust in you. And we have the same message, friends. Jesus stands before us today as the resurrected Lord. And since he is the Lord, we can trust him for the present day, for the future, and for priorities of life. If we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, for instance, it impacts our prayer life because we walk out of this room today and whether we go to a family event or whether we go back to work, our prayer is, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. You are the Lord of Rockwell, the Lord of the hospital, Mercy Hospital, the Lord of General Mills, the Lord of whatever it is, wherever you work. Whatever family situation, you go into that place saying, I need to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And I'm going out today to be your ambassador. You own it all. It affects the way we pray and live. And it affects the way we see the future. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This life is not all there is. One of uh, my friends said to me on Wednesday night at Life Group, he says, you know, somebody told him, you know, sometimes we look at the past and we, we wish we could change things in the past, but he says, you've got to drive a stake down right today and just forget about the past and think about what's between this stake that I'm driving today and the cross, which is the day I pass into eternity. 
And he says, you've got to give your attention to between now and then, that little section of life, and think about eternity. That's what Jesus is saying. I am the resurrection and the life. Don't put all your eggs in an earthly basket because a better day is coming. We live in light of eternity. And then Jesus says, I am Lord, and therefore live your life with love. Be so infected with the love of God that he has for us, despite our sinful, sinful hearts. He, he loves us just as we are. We don't have to clean ourselves up to get ourselves in with God. He came to this planet and walked this earth. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing we can do to gain entry into heaven. All we bring is our sin. But Jesus loves us. Live your life loving God. That's primary objective number one. And then pass on that love to everyone you meet. The gospel writer John said it this way in 1 John 3, 17 to 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You know, I could see somebody today saying, you know, the Bible's right, Jesus is right. And I see this insert in the program. It says, be missional, make a difference. You know, if Jesus is Lord, I need to get involved in this angel tree thing. There's 25 children's gifts yet to buy. I could show the love of Christ by buying a, a child a gift. Their parents are in prison. There's 25 stockings that need to be stuffed. I could go out to that tree afterwards and the love of God flowing through me, I could, I could pass on some joy through a stocking. And there's 23 guardians who will be coming here to celebrate Christmas with their children, and, and they need gifts. And I could be one who could purchase a $15 gift for a guardian, and, and I could show them the love of Christ. Or I could be a family host, which is really out of the comfort zone. Because that means I'd have to show up here on that Saturday and host a family as they come here to worship God and then go down to celebrate with a meal and receive the gift. I've got to walk with them. But my heart is brimming with the grace Jesus has for me, and I could take that step to enter in and be a host for these precious people that Jesus loves. I could bring a large bag of frozen mixed fruit. I could bring whatever a two press and a seal is. And I could bring one hot cocoa container. I, I think by the end of this day, all those things will be met because Jesus is Lord. Author Warren Wiersbe said that when a lamb was to be sacrificed, as it said in Exodus, they had to examine the lamb to make sure it was unblemished. Jesus went under the very critical examination of these religious leaders, and they discovered he was unblemished. And as we come to this table to acknowledge our sin and to receive again the bread symbolizing Jesus' body in the blood, the cup symbolizing his blood, we can only say, oh God, fill my heart again with your love. Help me to see all of life through your lordship. May I surrender every area of my life and fill me with your love so that I love you and I love my brothers and sisters and I love the unlovable. Oh God, come in the power of your spirit, we pray as we worship you in this communion meal.
In Jesus' name, amen. What a great song leading us into a week of thanksgiving. We can give thanks. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus ransomed us. He's our Redeemer. He paid the penalty for our sin. And yes, Jesus is Lord of all. Don't we have a lot we can give thanks for? Amen. Amen. I hope to see you on Wednesday night at our Thanksgiving Eve service where we can publicly thank God for all that he's done. Also want to remind you of our three-minute rule. We give you permission. We even encourage you to take the first three minutes, find someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and say, I'm glad you're here. Now may the Lord bless you with his grace and his peace. Amen.